Moving very swiftly on, uh, very lucky to have the next chap here. Not sure if, if any of you read Bob Lefsetz's uh, newsletters. Uh, some time ago, he blew up uh, talking all about crowdfunding and director fan engagement. And there was always one person at the heart of his message. Ladies and gentlemen, he's come all the way from New York to be with us. He's the founder and CEO of Pledge Music. Please welcome Benji Rogers. Hello. How's it going? Excellent, excellent. Um, I feel a bit professional right now. I've got a microphone on, and I'm staring at screens with some presentation that I built. And I feel a little odd because I was a musician and a bartender about four years ago. And I feel very blessed and honored to be here and be invited to speak and share a few words on direct-to-consumer crowdfunding and direct-to-fan. Um, I was, uh, I'm getting a lot of the data that's going to be in this from a study we did with Nielsen in the US. And I think it's a really fascinating uh, it's some really fascinating data that I think will apply to the Asian markets, and it's one of the reasons that I've come here is, is to kind of look at ways to expand what we do, uh, the successes that we've had into the Asian market. So if I'm talking about America a lot, please know that we'll, at the end I'll get to the point. Uh, I do understand. So in the US, there is up to $2.6 billion a year in incremental revenue left on the table by the music industry simply because fans aren't being sold music in the way that they want to consume it. They're offered streams, they're offered uh, buy buttons, they're offered products, they're offered retail. But what's really fascinating is, is that there's a certain subset of these fans, we thought it was a subset, it's actually a huge base of fans who want more, and no one's really giving it to them. And as we can see, consumption has been at an all-time high for a long time. Uh, temp, uh, rise of 10% in time listening on smartphones. We're seeing massive growth in streaming, massive growth in radio, massive growth in, well, not massive growth, but growth in album sales. And what we saw on the platform that we designed, which is a direct-to-fan fan funding hybrid platform, was 176% growth in pledges. And that posed some interesting questions. In the US, 40% of US music consumers are fans. These are a subset of the music buying population who are just dedicated. And these guys account for about 75% of all music spending, between 20 and 26 billion per year. And what was interesting was is there are other designations which Nielsen came up with. You've got your digital fans, you've got your aficionados, which are the most hardcore fans, then you've got big box fans, retailers, people who buy in those kinds of stores, Digital fans, occasional music consumers, and ambivalent music consumers. And we're a super fan platform, really. I mean, that's kind of where, where, where a lot of this data was coming from. But what was really interesting was 87% of the users who have these director fan experiences identify themselves as aficionados, as super fans. These guys want everything. They want to read the liner notes. They want to be a part of all that the artist does. But 8% are ambivalent music consumers. And these are the ones that interested me the most. Because when, uh, when you ask all of the sections of the fan base what they want to do, do they want to connect with artists? You know, I, want to, I like it when I have the inside scoop about music. I'd like to know more about the creative process. I would like to know what they're like as people and how they live their lives. We're talking that in cases of big box, 68% want to know that. 55% want to know that from the digital space, and 59% want to know that from aficionados, which is kind of obvious. And what fascinates me there is, is that we don't offer, as an industry, any of these people what they want at this point. It's basically money left on the table. And the ambivalent US music consumers are willing to spend an average maximum pledge of $67 and an annual of $116 if a specific type of campaign is offered to them, if a specific way of consuming the music is offered to them. They currently spend $68 a year. So if you think about what I'm proposing here is, is that you say to someone who would normally spend $68 a year, we want to offer you a specific way of consuming this music, they're willing to pay for it. I mean, you can see at the moment, big box fans spend 182 per year. Digital fans, 344. Aficionados, 402. And this odd bunch of people called pledgers spend over 1,000. 
And I think it has a lot to do with the way that albums are positioned in the marketplace. Um, they basically have three release milestones. Pre-order my album, which goes D to C, iTunes, Amazon, retail. Buy my album, D to C, iTunes, Amazon, retail. Have you bought my album yet? D to C, iTunes, Amazon, retail. And all of these basically lead to retail scenarios which are not specifically fan um, experiences. So again, and then sales to iTunes and Amazon and retail equal return customers for iTunes, Amazon, and retail. And then you've got direct-to-fan sales, which equal return customers for the artists and the labels. I was struck by the number of YouTube stars that I've been seeing who have a very hard time monetizing the things that they actually want to sell. And that's something that will have to change because we'll see the potential size of the market there. And long lead direct to fan campaigns, which is kind of the sweet spot of what I'm talking about, simply offer labels, artists, and managers more time to market and not less. So a traditional marketing campaign takes place after the creative process, once that part is over. And it requires a finished product. But new direct to fan doesn't require a finished product and actually begins and actually is, a, is to me, the process of sharing demos, pre-production, recording, mixing, mastering, artwork, manufacturing. All of these things are part of the story. I think that the YouTube stars of today can teach us that. You often see them as these things are being made in real time, not once it's happened. We don't, it's not about the end result, it's about the process. And so each part of the recording process, to me, and I think the data supports this, should become a part of the marketing process. And if we look at the traditional release model, this is essentially what happens. You've got studio, nothing. Traditional marketing begins, street date, and then the curve. What we've seen is if you offer direct to fan early on, as the record's being made, that's the, an actual based income line from a campaign that we've seen. And if you look at this first blip here on the side, that's profitability. And then about 60 days in would be when a traditional crowdfunding campaign ends. The rest of that is basically profit. So this is, a, this is an album that was profitable before it was put into production, before it was even recorded, it was in profit. And you still do the traditional release. You still do everything that you're going to do normally. You still put on Spotify, on iTunes, on RDO, YouTube, you name it. But the key here is, is to engage the fans, the evangelists, the one that will carry this message early on. And if you look at it from the, the standpoint of traditional music industry, you've got the record label takes finished product to retail, Amazon, iTunes, and the local vendors of the same ilk, who then sell it to the record label's customers. But what if the record label and the artist market release as it's being made to the fans, the profitable project goes to retail, and then is marketed to all. I guess what I'm saying here is, is that in, in, terms of, in terms of the way music is released, I don't believe it's necessarily the label's job to sell to the fan. I think that's the artist's job. The label should sell to everybody else, should augment what's already there, and that's really been a key. Um, we have a very unique system of doing it. I'm not trying to plug what we do. I just, there's no one else does it this way, so I'm gonna have to share a little bit of insight in you here. But essentially, oops, what we talk about is, Social and discovery is hugely important. Um, according to Nielsen's data, 77% of people received updates from the band, as in followed them on Facebook or Twitter prior to pledging. 92% discovered this platform via an artist mention on social media. 65% subscribed to an email list or newsletter. And the email list number is absolutely huge. And you've got 73% contributed without a personal connection to the artist. So that's when we talk about crowdfunding. A lot of people will say, People who crowdfund, it's just their mom or their dad giving them money. That's not actually the case. 81% discovered the campaign through the artist, and 40% listened to music on the regular basis. So this is on a weekly basis. This is a, big sub, this is a big bunch of people who want this type of experience. And I'm going to go into a campaign that we ran. The Ben Folds Five did this tweet January 12th of, uh, sorry, January 25th of last year, which basically said, it's happening for sure. Day one in the studio with Robert and Darren through March, new at Ben Folds 5 record. Now, I, saw, I, got, I got this tweet. It was reposted all around the world. It was a very, very popular tweet. As you can see, 1,188 retweets, but I couldn't do anything with it. There's nothing that can happen at that moment. And then likewise, you've got a picture of a string chart from the new Ben Folds 5 album. 1665 likes, but I can't do anything with it again. So what happens is, 
People can comment, they can talk about it, but they can't really do anything. If you insert a director fan layer, a way to monetize at this point, then all of a sudden what you're seeing is 1,064 people will pledge on or pre-order or buy direct to fan the album as it's being made. And then you can see that was a text update only that still syndicated out to Facebook and Twitter, that still did all of that stuff. Again, a second update, calling all radio journalists, 1,144 pledges, added three new items. They were talking about more that they were going to offer to the fans to buy. Again, another 1,000. Now, these aren't huge numbers, but the average pledger spends $55 per transaction. So what you're talking about there is, you know, as the campaign rolls along, they're, they're willing to spend, but we don't offer them the ability to. We wait till the very last minute, and then we try and bundle them all through one very narrow funnel to iTunes, Amazon, et cetera. So if you look at it, what, what kind of things are on offer to get them going? Signed and framed set list. The show was on. He signed the set list. It appears. This is while the album was being made. This is not. Again, there's no finished product at this point. Then you've got additional items, signed and framed set list, signed vinyl test pressing, your name in a song, new CD plus Ben Folds 5 tour t-shirt. A lot of standard products, but also a lot of hybrid stuff. And these are what the updates look like. They're basically the same as social media posts. The difference being that fans can actually action them in real time. Then you've got, um, uh, here is an example of um, Robert from the band at the test at the pressing plant showing fans the vinyl that they're actually going to receive. This is all stuff that would traditionally be hidden from the fans' view. But if we look, these updates, along with 21 more, led to 5,092 pledges during the campaign. The launch tweet and Facebook post alone, just announcing that this thing was happening five months prior to release of the album, got 2,433 pledges. And again, if the average across our site is $55, whilst I can't reveal the exact numbers, you get the picture. So exclusives and updates, these, this way of conversing with fans while the process is in, is, in, is in progress are absolutely essential. It's not the same as just broadcasting on YouTube, giving it away on Facebook and Twitter. That's a non-monetizable event. And what you're trying to do is, is gather people with public broadcast. This is a very private thing. Um, part of the, the way that we do this is there's a syndication element to this. The artist creates the update. The update auto posts to the artist's Facebook and Twitter. And then the fans can automatically elect to share this. So you've got this massive syndication of what the artist is doing in real time. This doesn't have to exist just on our platform. This can exist on pretty much any platform if it's wanted. And to me, the golden goose, if you will, is going to be in streaming. Once this is put into the streaming layer, where all of a sudden these updates start popping up into your stream as you're listening, this to me is going to be the future of this process. And then we can talk about fans say that they're likely to contribute to a campaign given this exclusive content, given this way of engaging. And as you can see, the most striking number for me is, is that 32% of the ambivalent music consumers, the ones that give the least and put the least into the musical economy, are likely to give, and 12% of them are very likely. What do we give them currently? We give them free videos free tweets, free Facebook posts. They don't have a chance to be involved. So then we said to them, what specifically would make you get involved in a campaign? And the answer was, pre-order a digital copy of the album, available as a download, and get access to exclusive content, and the keyword, while favorite band is recording new album, starting at $15, with these other items on top. So again, going back to that first moment, they spend $68 a year currently. They would spend $67 for this if they could. And again, looking at the likelihood of it, aficionados, obviously 53%. But still, 22% of the ambivalent music consumers would buy into this. And that represents a huge, huge part of the pie. So then we looked at how many the market size. And this is just, again, to the US, so we can extrapolate outwards for Asia and for the rest of the world. But the number of people interested in director fan slash crowdfunding, the number of people unaware and interested in director fan slash crowdfunding makes up a total of $9 billion per year left on the table. You know, again, aficionados, big box, and digital. And then this isn't even in, you know, including the casual fans. So again, this is about chart eligibility. This is not to take away from anything that's already happening. It's to enhance it and to add that. And I think that if we're honest with ourselves, true direct-to-fan minimizes risk. Because ultimately, what would happen was is labels are basically put, shelling out money to make these things happen. Why? The fans will do that for you. 
I'm not talking about them just funding it. They will not just fund it. They will carry the message to their friends, their peers. These are the evangelizers, the super fans. And if you send a super fan like me to iTunes, what's the most I can spend? Maybe $20. Whereas I spent 55 per transaction. I spent 200 on Ben Folds 5, not just because he was on a platform, because I'm a big fan. And if I get sent to a static direct-to-consumer store, all I can do is buy one product, one moment, gone. To me, that's the equivalent of asking people to sign up to iTunes again and again and again. Imagine if every time you logged into Spotify, you had to create a new account just to get hold of what you want. So that's where I, where I re differentiate between direct-to-fan and direct-to-consumer. Because the reality of it is, is that direct-to-consumer is saying, here are some products on a page. Come and buy them. Crowdfunding is saying, please give me some money, and then I will go make. But direct-to-fan is be a part of this process as it's unrolling, as it's unfolding. As we move along, you, the true hardcore fans, are a part of this journey. And so I think that the, that the true, you know, we always talk about piracy. You can't pirate an album that has not yet been made. You can buy into that process. You can steal a ticket. But again, you're having to log in, create an account, and you're, you would be literally stealing directly from an artist. And I think that that's something that most pirates would have a very hard time doing. So 82% of the people polled buy a physical product. This is all pre-retail. This is before any money, anything has been put into a shop. So if you can imagine it, and the important takeaways here are that fans want a more personal relationship with their artists. And at the moment, we are not giving it to them. There is up to $2.6 billion in incremental revenue left on the table every year because fans simply can't buy what they want. And that's in the US alone. And incremental revenue can be tapped by artists, labels, and brands. And one of the things that occurs to me is, is that wherever I've traveled in the world, there's one similar thing, which is that we offer fans a one-size-fits-all experience. It's very easy to think in generality when you live in detail. But the whole purpose of, of this is, is that this is one artist at a time sharing the process of what they are doing, not just the end result. And to me, that's the future of a new musical economy that is at, as yet completely untapped. And I'm being asked to wrap up, so thank you very much. <laughs>